thanks very much for inviting me to come and, and give uh, this talk. Um, I'm going to be talking to, to this title of, of Behaviour of People with Learning Disabilities Described as Challenging a Positive Behaviour Support Approach. Now, this is a bit of a mouthful, um, Behaviour of People with Learning Disabilities Described as Challenging, um, uh, and I won't manage it by, by any means, and we'll start talking about challenging behaviour. The rationale for this terminology is, is I think, um, correct in, in that it's about um, trying to note that the challenging behaviour isn't necessarily owned by the person with learning disabilities, but nonetheless it's a bit of a mouthful to, to use in, in everyday practice. Um, I'm, I'm conscious that, I don't, how, how many people here work, work in the learning disability field? Right, so actually the majority um, work. There, there probably are, are a small number perhaps who, who maybe don't work in learning disability. Um, uh, so I, I, some of the things I say, I, I, will, I will introduce things and perhaps say things that the majority of you um, don't need to hear, but, but just to try to provide some, um, some context. Right, just some, some acknowledgements um, before I get going. Uh, there are lots of people that I've discussed the, sort of the ideas and the issues around positive behaviour support with. Um, I wanted to particularly mention a, a special issue of a journal called the International Journal of Positive Behavioural Support, which is, is going to be coming out, um, I think, this year, uh, and which is, a, which is focused on, on defining and elaborating um, positive behaviour support uh, in, in a way that, that hopefully will be helpful to practitioners from a range of, of different disciplines. And I, I would certainly refer you to that, and, and some of the colleagues that are mentioned here uh, have been involved in, in writing the articles for that issue, and it will provide a much fuller and more comprehensive um, discussion of the issues than, than I can manage in, in uh, an hour this morning. Uh, I also want to, to um, acknowledge the contribution made by Malcolm Adams. Um, uh, many, uh, well, some of you here, I, I guess, will have known Malcolm. I didn't personally know um, Malcolm, but I knew, of course, of the very substantial contribution he made to clinical psychology, uh, and especially in, in the early part of his career um, to services for people with learning disabilities. Uh, in the, the Cambridge um, area. So I was very saddened, as I, I'm sure many of us were, to hear of his death earlier this year. Okay, um, what I'm going to try and do is uh, to uh, start off by uh, commenting on some of the the, the overall problems that we face in the area of challenging behaviour. Um, not just at the clinical level, but, but more, more broadly. Um, I'm then going to say a bit about some of the things that we know about challenging behaviour, and that's clearly going to be relatively quick. Um, I'm going to introduce positive behaviour support um, and comment on uh, where it comes from, some of the evidence uh, uh, around it. Uh, just in passing there, it's worth noting that some people talk about positive behaviour support and some people talk about positive behavioural support. Um, in practice, I don't think it makes a lot of difference. Uh, those who use positive behavioural support uh, suggest that it reminds us of the behavioural roots of the, of the approach. Um, others who use positive behaviour support um, think it's quite good in, in, in concentrating on the positive nature of the support provided for people's behaviour. I'll, I'll tend to just talk about PBS, which will avoid that problem. Um, then, having talked a bit about what positive behaviour support or PBS is, uh, I'll move on to looking at some of the issues around its use and practice. Um, and, and in particular, put that in the context of some of the work that's going on at the moment in, in the wake of, of the Winterbourne View scandal. So some of the initiatives that are coming uh, out of Transforming Care, which was the, the government's response to, to Winterbourne View. 
Um, and I, I'll talk about that in, in terms of positive behaviour support, uh, both at the level of individuals and at the uh, and at, at, at broader, more organisational uh, levels. And then I'll, I'll sort of summarise and, and finish off. Okay, in terms of the, the overall problems um, that we face in the, in the area of challenging behaviour, um, the, the first and, and one of the most obvious things is the number of both children and adults uh, who, uh, by reason of or because of the, the difficulties that uh, local services and families have in responding and supporting uh, their challenging behaviour, uh, are by reason of that um, placed in uh, residential schools in the case of children and assessment and treatment units or uh, other sorts of, of typically out of area um, placements as adults. Now I'm not talking here about the general run of out of area placements. Um, in Kent we've got thousands of uh, still seaside um, homes for people from London or whatever most of whom don't display challenging behaviour. I'm talking here about, about services that are, in a sense, specialists that, are, uh, that, that in a sense, arise because of the, the difficulties that we have in, in coping with challenging behaviour. Now, these are um, very expensive services. Um, uh, they are uh, typically 200,000 a year or, or more. Um, and we're talking about really quite large numbers of people here. So if you, if you average this out across the roughly 150 local authorities in England, you know, you're talking about um, 40 people in each local authority, um, which when you add up the, the numbers in terms of costs, means you're talking about something like 1.2 billion uh, in money being spent on, on these placements. So major cost, um, uh, and probably um, not terribly effective in terms of the kinds of supports and quality of life that are experienced by uh, the individuals uh, living in those services. Second general um, uh, sort of bit of where we are is in terms of the repeated scandals. Now, I don't need to remind you of, of Winterbourne View, but of course, Winterbourne View is only the most recent in fact, it's not even the most recent in a sense, of uh, a, a series of scandals um, which uh, have arisen in services for people with learning disabilities and which have often been uh, at least in part related to uh, challenging behaviour. Um, so some of the issues around Winterbourne View um, were to do with the, uh, the overuse of restraint, with the use of punishment strategies and so on. Uh, and of course, many of the people who were there because in theory they, uh, their behaviour was too difficult to manage um, anywhere else. And if we go back to the, the other more recent scandals in Cornwall in uh, the McIntyre Undercover um, uh, television programme in the late 1990s, again a lot of focus on restraint, on inappropriate responses to uh, challenging behaviour. So challenging behaviour is a major factor in, in, uh, in these repeated scandals. Thirdly, um, uh, a continued um, uh, finding that the needs of families and their sons or daughters are not generally well met by services for people with learning disabilities. Um, I've been involved with a charity called the Challenging Behaviour Foundation for many years um, and through their family support service, they hear on a regular basis about families um, facing great difficulties and not receiving the kind of support that they should. So I'll, I'll just read you um, a, a little case study um, which uh, recently came, came through and of course names and, and details are changed. Um, Edward is eight years old. He has severe learning disabilities, autism, epilepsy, and displays a range of challenging behaviours, including self-injury. He was offered respite in a care home. His family provided the staff with detailed information about Edward and what was important to him, and went to the home to provide staff with training about how to support him. The home had a high turnover of staff, and Edward often had different staff supporting him. Four months after he first went there, Edward went to the home for a break. 
His family explained he was particularly anxious with an increase in his behaviours and should not be taken out but supported in the home. Staff took him in a minibus with other children to an airport. There was an incident. Edward bit a member of staff and he was permanently excluded. Visits from home carers were offered as an alternative, but this did not work for Edward or his family. His parents were exhausted and suffering from serious stress-induced conditions. The family described their experience as you have to reach crisis point and go even lower. Edward is now at a residential school. Quotes from the family, it was the best thing for him in the end. We are strong, proactive, intelligent people with very supportive extended family and the experience almost destroyed us. I think later on this morning there are some sessions where we'll hear um, alternative ways of responding to those kinds of situations, much more constructive um, ways. But unfortunately that kind of scenario is, is all too familiar, um, where uh, families only receive um, support when the situation has got to crisis point or beyond. Uh, and of course, the, the, many of the, the potential solutions that might have existed before then are no longer, are no longer viable, so that the, uh, the solution, as it were, is, is uh, exclusion and uh, placement in a residential school, uh, which may then actually lead to a career in residential um, care. And then the fourth um, uh, general aspect of, of the situation around challenging behaviour is, uh, is what I've called poor and declining quality of social care. Now I can't provide any, uh, any uh, evidence of, of that in terms of a measure of quality of care, but I think I can point to a number of, of aspects which are, are clearly apparent at the moment and which uh, are undoubtedly, in my view, affecting the quality of, of social care. Uh, for a start, there's the significant um, cuts in budgets. Um, the Association of Directors of Adult Social Services estimated that the cuts in adult social care budgets from, I think, 2010 to 12 or 11 to 13, can't quite remember, uh, were of the order of 1.9 billion um, across, across England. Uh, very substantial amount and the cuts have by no means finished in terms of, of those kinds of, of budgets. And this of course is set up against demographic pressures, not just in older people but also around people with learning disabilities that are leading to increasing demands for, uh, for social care input. I talk to um, social care providers quite regularly um, and uh, some of the people that I, some of my researchers are, are regularly in social care services. And what, what they tell me is that uh, it's, uh, there's an increasing squeeze inevitably because of the, the, the cuts on staff in residential settings, especially management staff, uh, that it's increasingly difficult to recruit staff who are typically paid to minimum, minimum wage anyway. Uh, and they are, uh, those staff are often not of the best quality uh, and of course because of the limitations on management staff are not terribly well led uh, with almost inevitable consequences for the quality of, of support that they can provide. Now this relates to challenging behaviour in particular because, uh, and I'll, I'll come back to this later, the, uh, the quality of social care is I think directly related to uh, the occurrence of challenging behaviour and to the extent to which uh, social care services feed more specialist services uh, with individuals uh, whose challenging behaviour has become worse or has developed or whatever and who now require more specialist support and input. You could, I think, I mean, if, if it wasn't for the fact that these problems seem to me to be not, not really new, um, to have been long-standing. I think this could be described as a crisis, but it, in, in the sense that it, they're not new, they are long-standing, uh, perhaps we can describe it as a continuing crisis in, in terms of provision for people who are at risk of, of displaying behaviour described as challenging. So moving on and talking a bit about, about challenging behaviour, um, I'm going to go through a number of, of um, factors, number of influences on, on challenging behaviour. Um, first of all, um, I want to uh, 
note that um, challenging behaviour is socially constructed. Now, this is not to buy the reality of, um, of much uh, of the serious challenging behaviour that I'm sure many of you see on a regular basis and which leads to uh, uh, the need for uh, more specialist input. Uh, but it's also to note that, uh, that because of the, the very definition of challenging behaviour as, as something, for instance, that leads to or provokes more restrictive or reactive responses, uh, that the boundary is, is, is a permeable one. The boundary of, of what's defined as challenging and what's not defined as challenging is a permeable one. Uh, so, for instance, in social care settings, it's not unusual to find um, that uh, conflict between um, the staff who are working there and the people who live there um, is portrayed by the staff as challenging behaviour on the part of the, of the people who live there, um, rather than a simple disagreement or a different view of what should happen uh, in, in that situation. There was a very nice paper by Nan um in 2011, and the, the, there is a list of references, by the way, which uh, I think will be on the slides that are made available after the, after the conference. Um, in which he, he Nkusing uses the, the letters written by, serv by residential services in referring individuals to CLDTs because of challenging behaviour. Uh, and there's one very nice example which I'll just see if I can find and read to you. Yeah, um, verbally aggressive towards other people, unwilling to listen to reason, I can be very bossy, often involving myself in other people's affairs that do not concern me. Provocation of others into losing their temper with me, striking out at me, or shouting at me. Now, leaving aside the, the incredible perversity of presenting this referral in the first person, uh, you know, I, I'm owning my challenging behaviour. Um, the, the fascinating thing about this is that, is that the, uh, this person's behaviour is, is uh, referred for support, but, but who is striking him? Who is shouting at him? Um, is it the staff? Is it other tenants? They're not referred um, because their behaviour is provoked by this person who is challenging. So there's, there's an element of social construction which is, is very important to um, remember. The central feature of uh, an understanding of challenging behaviour um, from, from a positive behaviour support perspective is the notion that challenging behaviour is functional and has meaning um, for the individual in the context in which the individual finds themselves. Um, now, this issue will come up a number of times, but I want to just illustrate it with uh, some recent research um, by Beavers, uh, who has uh, summarised the results of functional analyses carried out with 981 um, uh, individuals uh, over the course of the last 30 years. Um, and has uh, categorised the, the functions identified uh, into those listed on the, the x-axis here. Um, so just over 30% classified as escape from uh, some kind of aversive stimulation, um, just over 20% as serving the function of obtaining uh, attention, typically of staff or caregivers, uh, just over 15% serving a function of, of producing automatic reinforcement, such as sensory stimulation. Uh, just over 10% serving the function of obtaining some kind of tangible outcome for the individual, perhaps food, um, perhaps a drink, perhaps an activity. Uh, and, and almost 20% uh, serving multiple functions, serving more than one of the, of the others on that list. Now the point here isn't, in a sense, to focus specifically on these particular functions, it's to note that uh, with a systematic assessment of the behaviour of these 981 um, individuals, it was possible in most cases to identify a clear function or functions served by their, by their behaviour, um, which doesn't carry the implication of, of, of any purpose on the part of the individual, um, but in a sense, simply describes the interaction between the individual 
uh, and the, the environment or the context in which they find themselves. So that's a central feature of challenging behaviour, <clears throat> but by no means the only feature. So challenging behaviour also reflects individual characteristics, um, such as the physical health status of the person. There's increasing evidence that, for instance, that uh, challenging behaviour is more likely when the individual is in pain. Uh, it reflects the mental health status of the individual. Some kinds of mental health problems may be associated with uh, increased uh, likelihood of challenging behaviour. It reflects the, the development of the individual. Uh, people with learning disabilities, of course, typically are, have cognitive limitations by definition, uh, have, have limitations in adaptive behaviour, uh, have limitations in communication skills, and in particular, uh, having difficulties in controlling the environment around you, either through your own efforts, your own direct efforts, or through your communication abilities is likely to be associated with challenging behaviour. And challenging behaviour is also associated, associated with genetic status, uh, with a, a, a large field of research which I think Chris Oliver is probably going to talk about later today, um, focused on the relationship between challenging behaviour and genetic syndrome. And I want to just illustrate that last point briefly. This data comes from previously published work, not by me, um, and looked at the scores on the aberrant behaviour checklist um, of four different syndrome groups. Uh, Down syndrome, Cree de Shah, Prader-Willi and smith McGuinness. And what it shows is that the, the average scores on the aberrant behaviour checklist were much higher for people with smith McGuinness. Uh, who are typically identified as having high levels of, of challenging behaviour. And if you compare that with Down syndrome, Down syndrome scores of average about 18, which typically wouldn't be regarded as, as definable uh, in, as challenging behaviour, uh, but up nearly 70 for smith McGuinness with the other syndrome groups in between. But it's very important to, to not see all these different factors physical health, genetics, etc., as being entirely independent of function. So one area of research has, has directly related the uh, genetic status of the individual uh, with the function served by their behaviour. And this is work carried out, data from work carried out by Paul Langthorne and myself, um, where two syndrome groups were compared, people with Fragile X and people with smith McGuinness. And if you see the, uh, the pattern of functions is quite different. Um, people with Fragile X syndrome are much more likely to demonstrate behaviour that's maintained by escape. Uh, people with smith McGuinness syndrome are more likely to demonstrate behaviour that's maintained by uh, the attention of others. So there's an interaction uh, between these various factors and, and the central feature, in a sense, is, is relating these factors to the function served by the behaviour. And then finally, um, challenging behaviour reflects environmental characteristics. Um, and there are obviously a wide range of these, but, but just to draw attention to, to some of them, um, challenging behaviour is more likely when there are high levels of social control and abuse, when there are low levels of social interaction, uh, when the environment is barren, when there is a rigid control of access to preferred um, activities, materials, objects, and so on. And again, to make the connection with function, um, the, the parallel between this list and the list of escape, attention, um, automatic, and tangible is not coincidental. Um, there is a, a relationship between the characteristics of the, the environment um, and the, the function of the uh, behaviour. So, uh, challenging behaviour um, is uh, at its centre functional, uh, but is influenced by a wide range of social, biological, developmental and environmental um, factors, um, all of which are likely to interact in various idiosyncratic ways for any particular individual. So that implies uh, a number of things, I think. Firstly, it implies that uh, if we're going to take account of the social construction of challenging behaviour, 
um, that we have to overcome what Ericsson called the institution of the mind, the, the way in which even in the light of deinstitutionalization and the development of community services, um, people with learning disabilities are still typically treated as uh, second-class citizens, as uh, not equal to the people who are providing um, support from them, uh, for them, and, and therefore uh, able to be dismissed in a sense as uh, displaying uh, uh, something like uh, socially constructed challenging behaviour. <coughs> Secondly, um, if we're going to take account of, of the biological influences on challenging behaviour, especially uh, the genetic ones, then that implies a need for early intervention or the, the potential value of early intervention, especially with high-risk groups. And I think there's a symposium after this which is going to focus particularly on that. Thirdly, um, if uh, there are physical and mental health um, issues associated with challenging behaviour, then we need to actively identify and, and tackle uh, those health issues. Fourthly, given the developmental um, difficulties, um, then we should be actively, both uh, through early intervention but also later, uh, providing support to develop the kinds of skills that people can use to control their lives better. Uh, and finally, um, in terms of the environmental characteristics, and, uh, I like this quote from Risley, we should provide lives that are reduced in stress, deprivation and fear, enriched in those things that attract and engage the person's interest and repertoire. Right, um, I was trying to think of a link for this, but I couldn't think of a link, so I, I'm just going to be honest and say this is a little bit of light relief in the middle of the, of the, of the session. Um, one of the things, I suppose it's an avoidance strategy, um, in the course of preparing this, I started thinking about all the different things that PBS could meet, could stand for. So, psychological backstory, right, that's not bad. Um, perhaps, <laughs> I won't say that because it will go on the, on the camera. <laughs> um, so, much more, uh, not very good really, quite banal, that's the best strategy. Um, I, I quite like this one, um, especially because it's reminiscent of, of at least one of the scandals that, that we've had recently where, where in the name of, of apparently positive behaviour support, this was one of the strategies that was being used. Uh, which, um, well, uh, in the social care context, yes, I, I in a sense was quite critical of, of staff earlier on, but of course um, support workers are typically poorly trained, poorly led, poorly uh, supported and often left to face things on their own that um, much better trained etc. people would, have, would struggle to, uh, to cope with. Um, and I think this is the last one, I've kept the uh, last till the end, that this of course is just my perception on, on positive behaviour support. Right. Um, so what is positive behaviour support? Um, well, it's a framework um, for developing an understanding of challenging behaviour and for using this understanding to develop effective support. And that word framework is quite important, and I'll come back to it in a minute. Um, there are a number of components, um, and as I mentioned earlier, this is in a sense a, a somewhat oversimplified description of, of the core components. Firstly, it's a personalised approach, uh, inevitably in a sense by virtue of the, the idiosyncratic nature of the particular influences on any individual's uh, challenging behaviour. Uh, any effective strategy for supporting the individual has to be personalised. Secondly, it's centrally based on systematic functional assessment uh, and analysis, uh, implied by the emphasis I gave earlier to the notion of function uh, 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 in challenging behaviour. Thirdly, it seeks to attend to the broader context, and that refers to the issues around health, issues around genetics, development and so on. So it's not purely by any means focused on just on the specific behaviour and its function. It takes a much broader perspective on, uh, on challenging behaviour. Fourthly, um, any effective approach to challenging behaviour has to both seek to prevent it, uh, but has to accept that sometimes there will be times when the prevention 
fails. So, so therefore, you have to have both proactive and reactive um, elements to uh, the approach. Fifthly, uh, it attends to quality of life. Um, it's very easy, in a sense, to deal with challenging behaviour, and the scandals show us how to do it. You know, you can, you can punish people, you can stand on them, you can tie them up, you can do all sorts of things that will manage and cope with challenging behaviour. But, of course, that will substantially damage people's quality of life. So PBS stresses quality of life both as a measure of, of the outcome of an effective strategy and also as part of the intervention itself. Part of the intervention itself is often uh, improving the quality of life of, of individuals. Uh, and finally, it seeks to avoid restrictive approaches as uh, much as, as possible. Um, again, for obvious reasons, given the, the damage resulting from uh, those restrictive approaches. What it's not? Um, well, it's not behaviour modification. Um, but um, PBS undoubtedly, part of its historical roots is in what we used to call behaviour modification, uh, what uh, has itself uh, changed into something called applied behaviour analysis. Um, positive behaviour support is a development from behaviour modification which takes a much broader perspective um, on the influences, on the causes uh, and the of, of challenging behaviour and the kinds of strategies uh, used to support individuals whose behaviour is described as challenging. It's not just being kind to people, and that may be obvious, but I, I certainly meet people whom I sure don't really understand that when I say positive behaviour support, I don't just mean being positive and supportive around behaviour in some sort of broad, broad sense. And it's not, I think, a specific psychological therapy. Um, it's not, um, uh, in that sense, like cognitive therapy or uh, any other kind of, it's not like uh, whether psychological or, or other kind of therapy. It's, it's rather the framework within which um, many different approaches may potentially be relevant to any particular individual and uh, be used. Uh, so it provides the, the broad framework within which both the understanding of challenging behaviour for an individual can be developed and uh, the support needed for that specific individual can be planned. In terms of evidence, um, uh, this is very much a very quick uh, flick through this. There are thousands of individual case studies and small group studies um, uh, providing support for the use of various different elements of, of PBS. Meta-analyses -analy meta of these studies suggests that uh, you get quite large reductions in challenging behaviour, typically more than 50%. In the States, uh, there has been considerable development in the use of what's called school-wide positive behaviour support, and I'll come back to that later. Um, with many randomised controlled trials demonstrating uh, significant effects. Uh, and in this country, there's been one randomised controlled trial of the use of PBS with adults with learning disabilities, uh, that's Hassi Otis uh, et al., um, in which the primary measure of challenging behaviour was reduced by 43% after intervention. Now, I think it's important to say that, that in comparison to uh, perhaps a, a, a medical research, this doesn't stack up terribly well at all. Um, and we're currently, there's currently a, a nice um, uh, development of, of a nice um, guideline on challenging behaviour, which Glynis Murphy is, is uh, chairing. And it'll be interesting to see what comes out of that in, what, roughly um, 18 months' time or uh, whenever. Um, but in comparison to many of the other things that, that we do as psychologists or that happen to people with learning disabilities, this is wonderful. You know, this is much better than most of the other things in terms of, of an evidence base than most of the other things that uh, happen to people with learning disabilities. Now, I want to um, talk a bit about um, the implementation of positive behaviour support through transforming um, care. 
Uh, transforming Care is the government response to Winterbourne View, which I'm sure many of you will be familiar with. PBS is explicitly mentioned uh, in Transforming Care in two of the actions uh, that are, that are uh, listed. And there are three other actions that are very highly relevant. And I, I'm, I'm quoting here from Transforming Care. BPS, British Psychological Society, to provide leadership to promote training in and appropriate implementation of PBS across the full range of care settings. Now, I must admit, I don't actually know what's happening about that, and it'd be interesting if anyone here, you can come and tell me later. The professional bodies will refresh a unified approach. A unified approach was a guidance produced in 2007 by the Royal College of Psychiatrists and the British Psychological Society and others, uh, and that some initial work has been done to refresh that. Skills for Care um, will produce a guidance uh, and support on commissioning workforce solutions uh, to meet the needs of people with challenging behaviour. And that is underway and is taking a focus on both positive behaviour support and, uh, and physical interventions. The Department of Health with external partners will publish guidance on best practice around PBS so that physical restraint is only ever used as a last resort. That's also underway, um, being led by the Royal College of Nursing, um, with a, a, a large group of other people involved in it, um, and um, uh, with uh, a fair amount of emphasis on, on PBS. And then finally, the National Health Service Commissioning Board and Association of Directors of Adult Social Services will develop spe service specifications to support clinical commissioning groups, all these acronyms, in commissioning specialist services. Um, and I want to pick up on this last one and, and talk a little bit about, uh, about it. Um, I think it's, it's I, I've been involved in some of these actions uh, and it's difficult to, to tell whether to feel optimistic about them or not. Uh, it's been quite difficult to get people to concentrate not just on trying to stop restraint or reduce the use of restraint, which is a, 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 a very good aspiration to have, but also to talk about what you're going to replace it with, what, what you're going to do instead, how you're going to um, support uh, people whose behaviour is described as challenging in ways that reduce the need for uh, restraint or other kinds of physical intervention. So I want to pick up on this last one about, um, which you remember was uh, specifications to support um, clinical commissioning groups. Now actually this has broadened considerably um, since it was described in Transforming Care and it's now about service specifications more generally um, for services for people with, with learning disabilities, um, which to, to include um, a, a much greater focus on positive behaviour support. Why do we need service specifications? Well, we already have lots, but most of them refer either to things which are quite irrelevant to the quality of care and support and outcome, or which are, are written so vaguely that they're of no use to, to anybody. Um, commissioners should be clear about what they want providers to do, and that should be based on evidence and professional opinion. And there's lots of evidence that, in Winterbourne View, but also in the the, the following inspection of specialist services, which was organised by the Care Quality Commission, um, that actually uh, there's very little evidence of positive behaviour support in practice, even in specialist services for people whose behaviour is described as challenging, but there's lots of evidence of, of high levels of use of restraint and other kinds of physical intervention. And that's not necessarily because anyone has said, right, we want you to provide a service that restrains this person several times a day, it's, it's partly because uh, there's been no specification of, of the nature of the service needed at all, and neither the commissioner nor the provider is really sure of, of, of how to provide or what sort of service to provide. So this has led on to the development of a service specification, which started with a focus on adults, uh, and which has now taken, uh, broadened to include both adults and children, and in, in the la over the last several months, uh, Nick Gore, who's talking later, has played a significant role in broadening the specification to include children and in making it a, a more uh, user-friendly document, more likely to be adopted document. Um, I want to just 
to illustrate uh, a couple of aspects from the specification, um, the way in which it, it identifies positive behaviour support both at individual and at organisational level. And these are excerpts, and I'm not going to read this out or expect you to read it. Um, at individual level, um, the specification seeks to define as clearly as possible what people should be doing with the individuals they are working with whose behaviour is described as challenging. And one element of that is um, that behaviour support is based on a holistic assessment, incorporating functional assessment, um, with then a, a whole list of, of potential sources of evidence um, that providers can provide or commissioners can seek uh, to establish some certainty that this is actually happening in practice. And the specification goes on then to talk about the content of the support package being provided uh, and, and its implementation and its monitoring and its review. But the other element of the specification is a focus on what the organisation um, should do. And again, there are a number of elements to this, um, but one element is providing leadership for and taking ownership of the implementation of, of PBS. Um, the idea being that PBS at the level of the individual um, is only uh, part of the possible solution. Um, that if PBS is going to be effective at the level of the individual, um, then the organisation, whether that be a care provider uh, or a health provider or whatever other sort of organisation, uh, needs to um, imbue itself with, with an organisation-wide approach. Um, to positive behaviour support. And as well as taking leadership and ownership, that will include, and the specification includes, elements related to staff training and support, uh, to quality assurance, and to a range of other uh, elements of, of uh, the way in which the organisation supports PBS in practice. I mentioned earlier on school-wide positive behaviour support. Um, and this slide uh, is... Uh, um, pinched from um, school-wide positive behaviour support. That's why it's got colours on, whereas none of the rest of my slides have got colours on. Um, essentially what school-wide positive behaviour support seeks to do um, is to uh, not just implement positive behaviour support with children in schools at an individual level, um, but uh, change the way in which schools operate so that they support positive behaviour, so that they prevent challenging behaviour, uh, through the whole range of um, methods, procedures, mechanisms uh, that they have at their disposal. It's a tiered approach. Uh, there are three tiers. The bottom tier, the green tier here, uh, is referred to as primary prevention um, and seeks to prevent challenging behaviour in the vast majority, uh, they estimate 80% of the pupils or students attending the, the school. Um, and that can include things like uh, very clear school rules um, about uh, how everyone is expected to behave and those, with those rules being very clearly displayed and very clearly implemented uh, and consecrated in terms of, of uh, whether people keep to them or not. Then at the next level, at the yellow level, uh, or amber I guess, um, there's the secondary prevention. Um, which is concerned much more with children who are at risk of displaying, particularly at risk of displaying challenging behaviour, for whom the more universal uh, arrangements that are put in place by the school may not be sufficient uh, to prevent their, um, their behaviour. Uh, and that would include things like uh, giving particular focus to high levels of interaction in the classroom between the teacher or the teaching assistant and the uh, the pupils or, or the students. And then at the final level, uh, the red level, um, we have simply individually focused positive behaviour support for those individuals for whom the, uh, neither the primary nor the secondary prevention strategies have been sufficient to prevent their challenging behaviour. And, and that goes back to all of the stuff that I've been talking uh, about up until now. Um, now, the, the reason for uh, using this slide and for um, uh, putting it in this talk is because, in a sense, what I've been talking about in respect of those service specifications um, refer to the 
the, the organisational and the individual levels of positive behaviour support. Now, it may be possible to discriminate between the green and the yellow in terms of learning disabilities. The analogy may or may not be completely exact, but I think the, the, the point uh, to make is that without organisational support for positive behaviour support, without um, PBS being implemented within uh, an organisational context, uh, it's likely to be much less effective. Right, I just want to summarise now. Um, we continue, I think, to um, fail to effectively support people whose behaviour is described as challenging, and I illustrated that um, earlier. Um, I don't think that's because it can't be done. Um, I think it's because we've um, failed to implement appropriate, effective strategies, um, not just in, uh, with individuals, but throughout the, the service um, system. Uh, PBS isn't a new therapy, it's not a new magic treatment. Um, it's rather a framework that, if properly implemented, can support um, uh, much better practice. But it's important that it's not just used at individual level. It's important that um, it's implemented in an organisational context. <clears throat> um, Ted Carr, who was one of the uh, founders of PBS, um, said that the central variable in, in PBS is systems change. Um, PBS is fundamentally a systemic, support, uh, systemic approach, which is um, <clears throat> seeking to change the systems within which uh, challenging behaviour occurs. And that then carries um, the, the final implication that organisational setting-wide positive behaviour support can promote high-quality social care, can prevent challenging behaviour, and can provide a context within which individually focused PBS can be more effective. Thank you.